How's it going everybody? Welcome back to the Satoshi Club where in today's video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about a 51% attack. So what is this and what does it constitute of? What kind of power would you have to have to actually conduct an attack such as this on Bitcoin, Ethereum or any larger network out there and how much it actually costs. So if you enjoyed the video, as always, you know, check out some of my previous ones. This is all based on hash rate. And there is a video that I made a few days ago. If you just check it up right there. Now, let's just get straight into it. It all depends on the mining hash rate. If you want to own 51% of some certain blockchain out there, you need to have and control 51% of the mining rate on the entire blockchain, which is also known as the hash rate, right? And with this hack, you're able to alter the blockchain in certain cases by, you know, preventing new transactions from gaining confirmations, for example, or being able to reverse transactions that happen. However, at the same time, it is very difficult to reverse these transactions that happened historically. And the further back you go on the blockchain, the more difficult it actually, uh, you know, is. And this essentially allows these hackers to create the double spended coins or uh, this is one of the issues that mechanisms such as proof of work were created to prevent because double spending of coins means you can literally duplicate value. And I do have a few explanations of that in some other videos, but it doesn't matter right now. What's important for you to know at this point is that changing these historical blocks is impossible. So you can only reverse transactions that happen. But at the same time, smaller networks are frequent targets for 51% attacks, right? And understanding a 51% attack a little bit more deeply, it does uh, require you as an actor or as an attacker to reach a majority consensus. To, so to own 50% of the mining power in the entire world, right? And this would basically mean you own the validation process and you can change the blockchain in any way, shape or form that you like. But how do these hackers actually manage to, you know, take some value from this hacked blockchain? Well, since you can't, uh, you know, go back in history and change blocks. Well, what they do is they port, they, they port their new version of the blockchain on the current blockchain and basically just starts living on from that point on the blockchain. And it's like an, another alternate reality or whatever, if you want to imagine it that way. And essentially, uh, they just are able to insert their new blockchain that has the codes and the info and the values and the specific, uh, you know, do's or don'ts that they want to put on their own blockchain. So uh, I hope you understand a little bit further right now. But, uh, you know, obviously, the further back transactions are, the more difficult it becomes to change them. And this, uh, you know, all happens through these mining pools, right? There are three mining pools in the entire world that control, uh, you know, about 56 or 60% of the entire hash rate in this world. And they are Foundry USA and pool and Binance pool. So you can see how many exa hashes per second they have. And just to compare, right, the cost of doing this one attack is huge, right? And here's why, right? If you want to buy this ASIC basic miner for cryptocurrencies, you're going to need $20,000 to get just one of them that has a hash rate of 255 Terra hashes per second. And just to compare Terra hashes and exa hashes, one Terra hash is one trillion, whereas one exa hash is one quintillion so that's six more zeros than a trillion has and you can imagine just the difference in scale of this hashing power right here and how expensive it would actually be uh, to reach the same type of power on uh, uh, you know one of these uh, you know just to conduct a 51 percent attack so very very difficult and you know i don't advise you try to do it but i think that's pretty obvious from this video but anyways these three pools make 56 percent of the network hash rate and it would put the fixed costs if you actually wanted to run one of these attacks close to 10 billion dollars plus building a building to host the equipment maintenance staff electricity and cooling all on top of this figure so it would be an absolutely huge amount and it would be completely redundant because the network can always choose to fork off to another network if you uh, actually you know hacked it and then you, all of your effort is there for nothing right so this is why nobody's touching bitcoin nobody's touching ethereum but uh, there were a lot of attacks earlier in the past that, you know, were on these smaller blockchains, such as Bitcoin Gold, such as a few more examples that simply don't have enough, you know, hashers and miners around, the, not hashers, hashing power and miners around the entire world to, you know, be able to be influenced by a lot less money. But 
Uh, as we can see, an entity would need to mourn more, more than 6.9 million Ethereum if they wanted to attempt an attack on the Ethereum network. And uh, obviously, it's not easy to hack as well. Because if you attack a network, you have to port your blockchain into that new blockchain at a very spe specific and precise time to be able to take advantage of it. And this is usually the most the most difficult part next to the money, obviously. But, you know, some people have successfully done it in the past with different smaller blockchains. If the outcome is successful, the attackers could block other users' transactions or reverse them and spend the same cryptocurrency again, which is known as the double spending problem. Now, uh, who is at risk of a 51% attack? And I forgot to let you know that if you want to learn more about these mining pools, hash rates and all this stuff, I do have a video on that as well, which you can check out right above me. But in any case, um, who, who is at risk of these attacks? Is it the big networks? Is it the small networks? Well, no, uh, it's just the small ones. It's Bitcoin gold. It's been a common target for attackers because it's smaller uh, when it comes to crypto uh, by hash rate, right? And, you know, there were 40 cryptocurrency, 51% attacks uh, that happened since June 2019. So a lot of hackers are actually attempting to do this on a lot of networks. But, uh, you know, it's getting more and more difficult, I would say with these larger networks especially and with these smaller networks because they simply are not worth it and this network can always port away to another blockchain so uh you understood right now from this story what is a 51 percent attack if you enjoyed the video drop a like subscribe to the channel check out the satoshi club telegram group one of the largest communities out there down in the description below and let's take a look at some bitcoin technicals for the end of this video so we have been sitting on this zone of around 18k for quite some time we did reach the 15k level for just a little glimpse a little bit above it and currently it seems like we are showing some reversal signs so the first sign of reversal that i did point out in the previous video is this relative strength index divergence where we can see that the price is making a lower low between these two points but at the same time the divergence is happening right here and the rsi is actually making a higher low right which means that, you know, this could be one of the potential reversal indicators. And also just looking at the market like this, we could, you know, looking at the higher time frame to say that Bitcoin does have an opportunity to, to continue moving more down. And in that case, my ultimate target would be around the 10K level. But uh, it all depends on where we break out on right now. If we break this zone of support right here, it is very likely that we continue moving down towards the 10K level gradually. But at the same time, if we do break the zone of resistance around the 18K level, we could easily start moving up into the 25K mark where our next zone of resistance lies. So that's pretty much it when it comes to Bitcoin. My advice is just to chill out, see what the market does this week and uh, react to what it does. And obviously hop into the lower time frames, you know, the hourly, the four hour, see what's going on. Because even on the four hour time frame, we are seeing a quite, uh, quite a nice bullish move, right? We are seeing a zone of resistance right here. It is a smaller scale head and shoulders pattern as well, which we can see. Um, let me just show you. Well, this, you know, it's a little bit irregular, but if you went even lower on the time frames, you would make sense of it. Uh, but basically we have the left shoulder, the head and the right shoulder. It's an inverse head and shoulders pattern. And we did make a break. And if you move into the ultimate lower time frames, we can see on the 15 minute that we are creating somewhat of a correction pattern, which could be bullish. But uh, let's just wait for price to come back into the FIB levels before we actually start to make any larger decisions. So we are, uh, you know, pretty much there at this point because I am looking at the log chart, by the way uh but you know we could make a little bit more of a retracement down here in any case i would advise you wait for uh you know the price to actually break the zone right here pretty strongly and then uh, look for a long position so uh that's it for today's video i hope you guys all enjoyed it my advice is that you shouldn't listen to anybody internet for trading advice anyways uh, i'm just giving my input on it you know how i viewed the charts myself so i'm not a financial advisor and you should do your own due diligence before investing into anything in the blockchain crypto or nft world and with that being said i'm gonna end the video right now hope you guys enjoyed it drop a like subscribe comment down below if you have any questions for me and i will see you all in the next video